Chapter Sixteen of the Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Sixteen. In the Darkness of Night. When Tarzan of the Apes realized that he was in the grip of the great jaws of a crocodile, he did not, as an ordinary man might have done, give up all hope and resign himself to his fate. Instead, he filled his lungs with air before the huge reptile dragged him beneath the surface, and then, with all the might of his great muscles, fought bitterly for freedom. But out of his native element, the ape-man was too greatly handicapped to do more than excite the monster to greater speed, as it dragged its prey swiftly through the water. Tarzan's lungs were bursting for a breath of pure, fresh air. He knew that he could survive but a moment more, and in the last paroxysm of his suffering he did what he could to avenge his own death. His body trailed out beside the slimy carcass of his captor, and into the tough armor the ape-man attempted to plunge his stone knife as he was borne to the creature's horrid den. His efforts but served to accelerate the speed of the crocodile, and just as the ape-man realized that he had reached the limit of his endurance, he felt his body dragged to a muddy bed, and his nostrils rise above the water's surface. All about him was the blackness of the pit, the silence of the grave. For a moment, Tarzan of the Apes lay gasping for breath upon the slimy, evil-smelling bed to which the animal had borne him. Close at his side he could feel the cold, hard plates of the creature's coat, rising and falling as though with spasmodic efforts to breathe. For several minutes the two lay thus, and then a sudden convulsion of the giant carcass at the man's side, a tremor, and a stiffening brought Tarzan to his knees beside the crocodile. To his utter amazement he found that the beast was dead. The slim knife had found the vulnerable spot in the scaly armor. He realized that he was in the creature's hidden nest far under the bank of the stream, and that doubtless the only means of ingress or egress lay through the submerged opening through which the crocodile had brought him. His first thought, of course, was of escape, but that he could make his way to the surface of the river beyond and then to the shore seemed highly improbable. There might be turns and windings in the neck of the passage, or, most to be feared, he might meet another of the slimy inhabitants of the retreat upon his journey outward. Even should he reach the river in safety, there was still the danger of his being again attacked before he could effect a safe landing. Still, there was no alternative, and filling his lungs with the close and reeking air of the chamber, Tarzan of the Apes dived into the dark and watery hole, which he could not see, but had felt out and found with his feet and legs. The leg which had been held within the jaws of the crocodile was badly lacerated, but the bone had not been broken, nor were the muscles or tendons sufficiently injured to render it useless. It gave him excruciating pain, that was all. But Tarzan of the Apes was accustomed to pain, and gave it no further thought when he found that the use of his legs was not greatly impaired by the sharp teeth of the monster. Rapidly he crawled and swam through the passage which inclined downward, and finally upward to open at last into the river bottom but a few feet from the shoreline. As the ape-man reached the surface, he saw the heads of two great crocodiles but a short distance from him. They were making rapidly in his direction, and with a superhuman effort the man struck out for the overhanging branches of a nearby tree. Nor was he a moment too soon, for scarcely had he drawn himself to the safety of the limb than two gaping mouths snapped venomously below him. For a few minutes Tarzan rested in the tree that had provided the means of his salvation. His eyes scanned the river as far downstream as a tortuous channel would permit, but there was no sign of the Russian or his dugout. When he had rested and bound up his wounded leg, he started on in pursuit of the drifting canoe. He found himself upon the opposite of the river to that which he had entered the stream, but as his quarry was upon the bosom of the water, it made little difference to the ape-man upon which side he took up the pursuit. To his intense chagrin, he soon found that his leg was more badly injured than he had thought, and that its condition seriously impeded his progress. It was only with the greatest difficulty that he could proceed faster than a walk upon the ground, and in the trees he discovered that it not only impeded his progress, but rendered traveling distinctly dangerous. From the old negress Tambudza, Tarzan had gathered a suggestion that now filled his mind with doubts and misgivings. When the old woman had told him of the child's death, she had also added that the white woman, though grief-stricken, had confided to her that the baby was not hers. Tarzan could see no reason for believing that Jane could have found it advisable to deny her identity or that of the child. The only explanation that he could put upon the matter was that, after all, the white woman who had accompanied the son and the Swede into the jungle fastness of the interior had not been Jane at all. The more he gave thought to the problem, the more firmly convinced he became that his son was dead and that his wife was still safe in London, and in ignorance of the terrible fate that had overtaken her firstborn. After all, then, his interpretation of Rokoff's sinister taunt had been erroneous. 
and he had been bearing the burden of a double apprehension needlessly. At least so thought the ape-man. From this belief he garnered some slight surcease from the numbing grief that the death of his little son had thrust upon him. And such a death! Even the savage beast that was the real Tarzan, a nerd to the sufferings and horrors of the grim jungle, shuddered as he contemplated the hideous fate that had overtaken the innocent child. As he made his way painfully towards the coast, he let his mind dwell so constantly upon the frightful crimes which the Russian had perpetrated against his loved ones, that the great scar upon his forehead stood out almost continuously in the vivid scarlet that marked the man's most relentless and bestial moods of rage. At times he startled even himself, and sent the lesser creatures of the wild jungle scampering to their hiding places as involuntary roars and growls grumbled from his throat. Could he but lay his hands upon the Russian? Twice upon the way to the coast, bellicose natives ran threateningly from their villages to bar his further progress. But when the awful cry of the bull ape thundered upon their affrightened ears, and the great white giant charged bellowing upon them, they had turned and fled into the bush, nor ventured thence until he had safely passed. Though his progress seemed tantalizingly slow to the ape-man, whose idea of speed had been gained by such standards as the lesser apes attain, he made, as a matter of fact, almost as rapid progress as the drifting canoe that bore Rokoff on ahead of him so that he came to the bay and within sight of the ocean just after darkness had fallen upon the same day that jane clayton and the russian ended their flights from the interior the darkness lowered so heavily upon the black river in the encircling jungle that tarzan even with eyes accustomed to much use after dark could make out nothing a few yards from him his idea was to search the shore that night for signs of the russian and the woman who he was certain must have preceded rokoff down the ugambi that the kincaid or other ship lay at anchor but a hundred yards from him he did not dream for no light showed on board the steamer. Even as he commenced his search, his attention was suddenly attracted by a noise that he had not at first perceived. The stealthy dip of paddles in the water, some distance from the shore, and about opposite the point at which he stood. Motionless as a statue, he stood, listening to the faint sound. Presently it ceased, to be followed by a shuffling noise that the ape-man's trained ears could interpret as resulting from but a single cause, the scraping of leather-shod feet upon the rounds of a ship's monkey ladder and yet, as far as he could see, there was no ship there, nor might there be one within a thousand miles. As he stood thus, peering out into the darkness of the cloud-enshrouded night, there came to him from across the water, like a slap in the face, so sudden and unexpected was it, the sharp staccato of an exchange of shots, and then the scream of a woman. Wounded though he was, and with the memory of his recent horrible experiences still strong upon him, Tarzan of the Apes did not hesitate as the notes of that frightened cry rose shrill and piercing upon the still night air. With a bound, he cleared the intervening bush, there was a splash as the water closed about him, and then, with powerful strokes, he swam out into the impenetrable night, with no guide save the memory of an elusive cry, and for company, the hideous denizens of an equatorial river. The boat that had attracted Jane's attention as she stood guard upon the deck of the Kincaid had been perceived by Rokoff upon one bank, and Mugambi and the horde upon the other. The cries of the Russian had brought the dugout first to him, and then, after a conference, it had been turned toward the Kincaid, but before ever it covered half the distance between the shore and the steamer, a rifle had spoken from the latter's deck, and one of the sailors in the bow of the canoe had crumpled and fallen into the water. After that they went more slowly, and presently, when Jane's rifle found another member of the party, the canoe withdrew to the shore, where it lay as long as daylight lasted. The savage snarling pack upon the opposite shore had been directed in their pursuit by the black warrior Mugambi, chief of the Wagambi. Only he knew which might be foe and which friend of their lost master. Could they have reached either the canoe or the Kincaid, they would have made short work of any whom they found there. But the gulf of black water intervening shut them off from further advance as effectively as though it had been the broad ocean that separated them from their prey. Mugambi knew something of the occurrences which had led up to the landing of Tarzan upon Jungle Island and the pursuit of the whites up the Ugambi. He knew that his savage master sought his wife and child, who had been stolen by the wicked white man whom they had followed far into the interior and now back to the sea. He believed also that this same man had killed the great white giant whom he had come to respect and love as he had never loved the greatest chiefs of his own people. And so in the wild breast of Mugambi burned an iron resolve to win to the side of the wicked one and wreak vengeance upon him for the murder of the ape-man. But when he saw the canoe come down the river and take in Rokoff, when he saw it make for the Kincaid, he realized that only by possessing himself of a canoe could he hope to transport the beast of the pack within striking distance of the enemy. So it happened that even before Jane Clayton fired the first shot into Rokoff's canoe, the beast of Tarzan had disappeared into the jungle. After the Russian and his party, 
which consisted of Paulvitch and the several men he had left upon the Kincaid to attend to the matter of coaling, had retreated before her fire, Jane realized that it would be but a temporary respite from their attentions which she had gained, and with the conviction came a determination to make a bold and final stroke for freedom from the menacing threat of Rokoff's evil purpose. With this idea in view, she opened negotiations with the two sailors she had imprisoned in the forecastle, and, having forced their consent to her plans, upon pain of death should they attempt disloyalty, she released them just as darkness closed about the ship. With ready revolver to compel obedience, she let them up one by one, searching them carefully for concealed weapons as they stood with hands elevated above their heads. Once satisfied that they were unarmed, she set them to work cutting the cable which held the Kincaid to her anchorage, for her bold plan was nothing less than to set the steamer adrift and float with her out to the open sea, there to trust to the mercy of the elements, which she was confident would be no more merciless than Nicholas Rokoff should he again capture her. There was, too, the chance that the Kincaid might be sighted by some passing ship, and, as she was well stocked with provisions and water, the men had assured her of this fact, and, as the season of storm was well over, she had every reason to hope for the eventual success of her plan. The night was deeply overcast, heavy clouds riding low above the jungle in the water. Only to the west, where the broad ocean spread beyond the river's mouth, was there a suggestion of lessening gloom. It was a perfect night for the purposes of the work in hand. Her enemies could not see the activity aboard the ship, nor mark her course as the swift current bore her outward into the ocean. Before daylight broke, the ebb tide would have carried the Kincaid well into the Bengala current which flows northward along the coast of Africa, and, as a south wind was prevailing, Jane hoped to be out of sight of the mouth of the Ugambi before Rokoff could become aware of the departure of the steamer. Standing over the laboring seamen, the young woman breathed a sigh of relief as the last strand of cable parted, and she knew that the vessel was on its way out of the maw of the savage Ugambi. With her two prisoners still beneath the coercing influence of her rifle, she ordered them upon deck with the intention of again imprisoning them in the forecastle, but at length she permitted herself to be influenced by their promises of loyalty, and the arguments which they put forth that they could be of service to her, and permitted them to remain above. For a few minutes the Kincaid drifted rapidly with the current, and then, with a grinding jar, she stopped in midstream. The ship had run upon a low-lying bar that split to the channel about a quarter of a mile from the sea. For a moment she hung there, and then, swinging round to her bow pointed toward the shore, she broke adrift once more. At the same instant, just as Jane Clayton was congratulating herself that the ship was once more free, there fell upon her ears from a point up the river about where the Kincaid had been anchored the rattle of musketry and a woman's scream, shrill, piercing, fear-laden. The sailors heard the shots with certain conviction that they announced the coming of their employer, and, as they had no relish for the plan that would consign them to the deck of a drifting derelict, they whispered together a hurried plan to overcome the young woman and hail Rokoff and their companions to their rescue. It seemed that fate would play into their hands, for, with the reports of the guns, Jane Clayton's attention had been distracted from her unwilling assistance, and, instead of keeping one eye upon them as she had intended doing, she ran to the bow of the Kincaid to peer through the darkness toward the source of the disturbance upon the river's bosom. Seeing that she was off her guard, the two sailors crept stealthily upon her from behind. The scraping upon the deck of the shoes of one of them startled the girl into a sudden apprehension of her danger, but the warning had come too late. As she turned, both men leaped upon her and bore her to the deck and as she went down beneath them she saw, outlined against the lesser gloom of the ocean, the figure of another man clamber over the side of the Kincaid. After all her pains, her heroic struggle for freedom had failed. With a stifled sob, she gave up the unequal battle. End of chapter 16